I don't know about most of you in the audience, but uh, I'm definitely want to figure out how to best use some of the technology and capture my students in the classroom. And I'm hoping that this is what um, they're going to show me how not to be the dinosaur scared of having kids use that uh, stuff in our classrooms. Anyway, I'd like to introduce Andrew Satcher. He's from East um, Mississippi Community College and from the research and, um, I can't remember the second half, the curriculum unit is um, Craig. And um, I don't know about you guys, but I'm looking forward to it. Okay. Most of y'all know I'm Craig Jackson. <coughs> and I appreciate everybody coming out first thing this morning. Um, I know half of you, this whole row here is a row of hecklers you know. Had a little change in the program today. A couple weeks ago, Brandon came over to the RCU and was visiting and talking about creating futures. And I told him what I was going to be presenting. He says, oh, man, I wish I had known that because I've got tons of stuff. And he started explaining to me all the things he had and could, could share with people about building their own technology plan. So, we came down here and yesterday I talked to King Brad and said, King, I thought you Brad do this specifically if you want to, that's fine. So Brad's a uh, networking instructor in East Mississippi and he has got a great presentation ready for you. So if you still want to handle somebody, Back to the show. This, Colonel good morning, good morning. Everybody ready to go home? Yeah. A lot of people are ready to go home. So creating my own technology plan, what is your plan? We all have choices. We all get to choose what we would like to use. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the different technologies we have. So we have a little laptop and desktop. We have our netbooks. We have tablets, smartphones, flip phones, even have typewriters, and paper and pen. So we've got a few things that are not going to crash on us. We've got a few things we don't have to worry about software issues. Well, at East Mississippi, I teach computer networking, but also the program is computer networking, but I teach Windows Server, Linux, A+, how to build computers, repair computers, as well as Security Plus, and web development. All right, so looking at the laptop and the desktop, that is our yacht. We've got all the bells and whistles. We've got all these external connections. We have keyboard, we have monitor, mouse, any type of external drive or camera, external um, wireless mouse, Bluetooth, anything we would like to actually use in our labs. Processing power, that's gonna get us the fastest way to get the job done. We all have smartphones which most of the smartphones we have today took, took the uh, astronauts to the moon. 1969, a computer with a lot less resources than what I have in my hand. All right, so we can get the big jobs done fast and we have a lot more RAM as well as a lot more features. Then we have our tablets. They're more of our sailboat. They they allow us that easy access on the go, but we have to buy a ton of accessories. We're in a tablet, I mean, we're in a laptop and a desktop. We have all those accessories built in. So some of you need an audio out. Some of you may want a video out. I forgot my video out for my laptop. It was sitting uh, connected to my projector. I have nice touch interfaces that we can use. Then we have our smartphones. They're our life raft. A lot of people are using them as their lifeline. Don't text and drive. Quit answering your phone while you're driving. They do have a small screen, or we could have a Samsung Note where you've you got to have pretty big hands to just hold the phone, and it's, there you go. Really nice, large screen. It fits in your pocket. We're not going to have to break our pockets trying to get it in there. You can't fit a laptop in your pocket. Well, you want something that's always going to be accessible. Then we have our older flip phones. Canoeing. That's our little canoe. Back in the day, we had some texting. You may not have a data plan. You may not have been able to even text. You may have been able to take a picture and then plug it back into a computer and get that data off. Well, today's technology, we have all that at the drop of our fingers. And it was good in case of emergency. Most people, that's how they had 
their old flip phones just for emergencies. Then we have our crash proof text processor. We don't have to worry about it crashing. We don't have to call IT. I can't get Word to work. What's wrong with pages? We just need a new ribbon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then paper and pen. With the paper and pen, again, all we have to worry about is ink and we got to make sure that Warehouser or any um, paper company is continuing making paper for us. But the real, the real issue is the good, the bad, and ugly, we've got to have the right device for the right job. You're not going to see someone, I hope you do not see any of your students or yourself, does a marker come off a laptop screen? Hopefully we know that. We're not going to take our Sharpies and write on our laptops. Well, when it comes to large amounts of data, we have different ways that we're going to need certain devices. The best, if we have large amounts of data that we're going to have to use, laptops and desktops. If you are um, trying to edit any type of video, if you're rendering uh, computer aid design, a laptop and a desktop today, they're using a combination of the processor and the graphics card. Well, the graphics is what shows the display. Well, a processor today, we may have a dual core, quad core, octa core, 12 core. We may have a motherboard with multiple sockets that have multiple processors in it. But the way that a graphics card works, where you've got multiple processors in your computer, you have thousands of microprocessors in a graphics card. So you can offload the processing power to your graphics card. With the graphics card, we've got a lot faster rendering. We don't have to wait for a week for it to render. It may render in a couple of minutes to an hour. If you're going to be recording music and you want to have a lot of tracks, if you want to be able to record drums and your guitar and someone singing and a keyboard, we have the ability to do that. Same thing with multi-monitor HD gaming. That's, uh, that's all my students talk about. Every time they come into class, they talk about how they didn't sleep last night. I played this game till I'm blue in the face. I, I used to be a big gamer. I, I don't have time for it. I don't watch sports. Like, what? You don't watch sports? This is my sport. I don't, I don't do a lot of stuff if it doesn't involve technology. In mobility, we have our tablets and notebooks. They're great for surfing the web. That we can quickly access any type of application data, whether it's the weather, whether it's where we need to go. Let's say we need Google Maps. We can uh, also record a single track audio. There's tons of programs out there. If you have an iPhone, you may be using GarageBand. With GarageBand, you can also create really nice presentations. It's lightweight, it's really easy to carry. Come on, wake up. But the freedom is up to you. Whether you're using a phone, a tablet, a laptop, or a server, that's your choice. But get the best out of those choices. So we have a couple of different operating systems that we could choose from. Some people enjoy Windows operating system. That's, that's what they know. Most people are going to stay in their comfort zone. I say to heck with that. Get away from your comfort zone. Try something new. I'm not saying go out and purchase everything possible, but go out and look for the newest, latest, and greatest. Some people enjoy Windows 7, or they're getting new laptops and new uh, convertible laptops where the keyboard will come off, and we just have a tablet for Windows 8. So it really depends on the type of device you're looking for. Um, Windows 8 does have a newer interface. Some people hate it, some people love it. I am towards the hating it just because I like a desktop. I don't want a phone based operating system. That's me. There's another, there's tons and tons of great hardware out there. Large touch, large touch displays. The bad thing about that large touch display, gorilla arm. You use that so much you just walk around with your shoulders just sore, just oh. I've got Gorilla Arms now because I'm using all of this touch-based sensors. We have tons of software that we could use. We also have Macintosh operating system. 
Some people prefer Macintosh. They have tons of software. But as long as we buy our applications from their app store, they'll update. But if we go out and we get some third party tool that's not available on the app store, it's not going to update. We'll have to manually update. So some people choose to go ahead and use an Apple. Myself, I enjoy Linux. I am a big advocate of open source. By the time we pulled in Canvas, I am just so tickled. Somebody complained, they're like, no, here in a year, Blackboard's gonna buy them. Blackboard buys everything and tears it up. Well, that is the beauty of Canvas. It is based on open source software. They release their source code. So let's say tomorrow that Blackboard tries to buy them. I can go out and I can get the source code and I can create, maybe I wanna call it Sessor instead of Canvas. I have the right. There's no law breaking, um, dealing with open source software. Where Apple and Microsoft, they're both proprietary companies. They only have so many developers. They only have so many um, people that can update and manipulate their operating system. Whereas with Linux, any user can be a developer. Any user can go in and make an application, do what they want it to do. The only thing they would like you to do is to put it back just the way you found it and say, hey, I found this application from this user and this is the user that I built my specs from. So you have different types. Um, the one thing I love about Linux, I'm not just updating the applications. Everyone's used Microsoft Update. What does it update? The Microsoft-based products. You have all these little tasks running in the background. Any services running in the background. You have an Adobe update. I don't know if y'all have administrative rights. Some of y'all don't have administrative rights, so you always got to call IT. Flash needs an update. I, oh, I need to update Adobe. I need to update Java. So it can be catastrophic at times when you're trying to get this one thing done in the lesson, and then you get a Java update and it can't render what you're trying to pull in. Um, there are free versions of different <coughs> flavors of Linux. Excuse me. Everybody has a favorite color, right? What's your favorite color? Uh, yellow. Yellow. What's your favorite color? Black. So it's preference. That's what I love about Linux. It's preference. What do you like? What do you need your operating system to do? Now free versions are we have purchase based versions where we can have support. We can have updates come into our system. The free versions I prefer the free version just because I don't like pay for software. I don't like to play, pay for software. All I need is a hardware device. Some type of device that I can use. All right, so looking at the hardware, let's look at some of these operating systems. All right, so we have Windows 8, Windows 7, virtual machine of Mac, which I'm just going to show you on my physical machine. Okay, so looking at Windows 7, a lot of people have the problem with all of the icons running in the background. They want to know, how can I get rid of these icons? I don't want to have so much running in the background. My machine takes forever to load. Every time I start my machine, I have to wait for it to load all of these services. All right, so one thing we can do to clean up those services is by running a command called msconfig. With msconfig or Microsoft configuration, we'll get this dialog box that comes up, our system configuration. So we can manipulate how our operating system is running. We can tell it what we want to actually boot, what services we want to run. For the most part, you can go to hide all Microsoft services and then different services, like I have Adobe Flash Player. If I want it to run as an update service, it will sit there in my system tray and as soon as the latest Adobe has come out, it's gonna tell you, hey, I've got an update. Same thing with any type of Motorola Helper or uh, TCP Auto Connect services, any VMware tools. And that's what I'm using. Um, I'm using VMware to allow me to run virtual machines. I have so many operating systems and so many ways to manipulate in our class that it takes a lot of different operating systems. So instead of me having to have my students 
reinstall, reinstall, reinstall. I simply can push out an image, they can pull it in, and they can just click start. They already have it in. So it's great for scenarios. When it comes to troubleshooting, without having a great scenario base, they don't know how to troubleshoot. So I'll go ahead and I'll go in and I'll stop services. I will break drivers. I will break parts of the operating system, send it out to students and fix it. This is your lab for today. So they're troubleshooting, they have to think about what am I doing? What am I trying to fix? We can also go into startup. This is gonna be where all of our items, anything that's popping up down in this screen, down on the bottom of our screen will be in this startup tab. We can uncheck them. As soon as we uncheck these startup entries, we won't have these items popping up. Now, depending on what you're using your operating system for, we may want a lot of options coming up at startup. Then we have different tools. Inside of the tools, it just tells you what the different versions are. They also show you exactly where, they, where the each command lives. So if I opened up the command prompt and I type in winversion.exe, it'll tell me what version of Windows I'm running. A lot of people get scared when they see the command prompt. I don't mind the command prompt. There's so many useful features. Help. Help shows every command that we could run. So I have my students where they have to know the command line because it doesn't matter what type of operating system you're using, as long as you know how that operating system, we have to communicate with it, they're gonna be all right. Okay, and Windows 8, again, I, can, I got my um, command prompt up, and then in the top corner, we'll get our little track pad, and we've got our search, share, the start. And this is what I was saying, I don't like that. That's a preference. Just like everybody's got a preference on the operating system or the layout they're using. To me, it's uh, dumbing down society. Again, that is my preference. I want my students to understand a computer, not just, oh, I can click this pretty button and then I get some type of information. Well, what, how is it doing this job? What is it talking to? How is it communicating? All right, and then going into a Macintosh operating system. Some people enjoy an Apple. I noticed I have a Linus Torvalds Kill Bill. Linus Torvalds was a college student, like most of us, have our college students in there. They're building applications. They may be creating games. Well, what he did is he created the last piece of the puzzle. The last piece of the puzzle was the kernel. All right, so what is a kernel? The kernel, not Colonel Sanders. We're talking about a key, uh, this is a K-E-R-N-E-L. With the kernel, what that allows you to do, it's the time cop, it's the scheduler, everything we do. When we ask the mouse to move, that is actually being interpreted by the kernel. When we hit a key, it's being interpreted by the kernel. Well, this did not start from just one guy. It started from a mindset, somebody, Richard Stallman in 1983. He was working at a college and he wanted to fix some Unix-based code. He wanted to take Unix and fix a lot of the issues they were having, but he couldn't do it. Ma Bell, AT&T, had two designers in 1969 that started the project called Unix. They built this operating system and AT&T owned it. So it was illegal for them to change it. He couldn't go in and fix issues, even if he knew the programming language. Well, what Stallman did in 1983, he said, okay, fine. I'll create my own operating system. All right, so this operating system, he wanted to do it in pieces and parts. All right, with the pieces and parts, uh, let me just open up a blank one. All right, he named it GNU, and I'm going to maximize that so you can see it. And what the GNU stands for? The G in GNU stands for GNU, GNU. But G GNU is not Unix. He wanted to have a community-based approach. 
kind of like Canvas is doing. That's what Canvas is doing. It's giving that community approach. What did the Canvas designers and presenters tell us? If you have a feature that you want and you like, go into the help and request a feature. That's the same thing that the Linux users do today. I want this portion of an operating system to have the ability to spin my desktop. All right, so somebody designs that. And that's, what, uh, that's the beauty of that idea. He took an idea and he ran with it. So he started creating applications. And instead of just locking the code down and saying, no, I made this, you can't see it. He sent it out and he posted it online. He wanted people to see it. He said, look, I've got this application. So he had to start building the entire Unix system layer by layer. And as he built each, the, as he built each program, he would put it out online. And people started taking these programs and they would take their expensive Sun-based OS and format. They would take all the data off and start adding these open source tool chains so they could get their job done really easy and they didn't have to pay for some proprietary based operating system. So the last piece of that puzzle was the kernel. He had tried multiple ways on creating kernels. They had a four kernel. They had four instead of one monolithic kernel being just one. He had four pieces and parts and they were trying to get them all to communicate and trying to uh, troubleshoot that was hell to say the least. So luckily Linus Torvalds created the kernel and getting back right into the way um, an Apple machine looks I'm not worried about that just close. Alright so we have different, out, different layout of the desktop they haven't changed it much in a lot of years they've just added new features new benefits, but Apple's based off of open source. A lot of their code, we can go out and we can download some of their applications and they'll let you manipulate them for free. You can get a software development kit if you want to build an Apple um, iPad app, an iPhone app. That's your choice. You have the ability and you can post it either on the App Store and someone can purchase it or you can just give them away. It really depends on your mindset. How do you want to manipulate that system? All right, so with uh, Microsoft, we always go into control panel to manipulate all of our settings. Well, Apple has a little bit different layout. It has where system preferences is the equivalent of control panel. We can manipulate all of our machine, how we want it to look. What type of desktop screensaver would we like? As you can see, I've got a couple extra ones down here. Air Display, Flash Player, and Flip for Mac that allows me to play Windows-based videos. But all the rest of them are built in by default. So if you have certain displays, certain features, we can go in and we can manipulate that. We can go in and manipulate how big we want the resolution, how we want the arrangement, any type of color. Uh, those of you who are in graphic design, you want a specific RGB palette. Uh, with your RGB palette, you can get the color the way you want. You can go and you can calibrate so it works and it looks identical to your external monitor. Uh, we also have our printer settings. Where Microsoft, we have to have the disk that came with our printer so we can install the driver. And what the driver does, <coughs> excuse me, uh, the driver is simply a software that talks to the hardware. All right, so anytime that we're installing a driver, we have to have it match. We have to have it match our operating system. So who was um, lucky enough to get a new laptop and they threw Vista on it? Anybody get Vista on the laptop? You are automatically scheduled to be a beta tester without your knowledge. They threw out Windows Vista in a state of disarray. They had to call Linux, they called OpenSUSE and Novell to come in and fix a lot of the issues. So why, why do we have all these programmers and all these developers that just say, oh, Microsoft Windows is the only way to go? It really depends on your preference on what you want that operating system to do. Uh, with, <coughs> goodness, get a sip of water. But all the drivers do 
is connecting to the colonel. Like we were talking about the colonel is that time cop, that scheduler. He gets resources to be able to go and communicate to our operating system. Without the right driver, we don't have good communication to that operating system. Uh, software update will go through our um, allows you to go through your app store and check to see if you have any type of updates available and the thing about this like I told you it's going to only update the applications that we purchase from the app store same thing when it comes to Microsoft if we purchase them off of Microsoft store we can get those updates for free unless we change to a new version and then we'll have to pay so that gets me down to the Linux operating system. I like the Linux operating system because it is really easy for my students to understand. They can see how the operating system works. Plus, they don't have to go out and install all of these different types of programs they need. Depending on the flavor of Linux that they want, they simply go out and they download an actual image. All right, so with accessories, we have different applications, whether it's for um, character mapping, we can donate. This version of Linux is called Uber Student. Yeah, there's crazy names. We have so many different wild names that just represent a group. Uh, file Manager, just like we would use Windows Explorer, or if you have an Apple, Safari. It's the same layout, but on a, um, on a Windows based operating system, what is your default hard drive? C drive. It always is C drive. Well, Linux takes a different approach. The top of the hierarchy is the root. All right, so then we also have the administrative account in Microsoft Windows and it's called administrator. Well, the administrative account on Linux is called root. It's the same, it's not slash, here is his uh, window, his folder right here, root. When it comes to applications, when it comes to all the different libraries and programs that work with each other, they all have a POSIX based interface. And with POSIX, it just makes it where all of the technology, all the layouts are going to be similar. So we can take an application that was built in one version of Linux, and pull it over to another version of Linux and it's going to work. Their layout, the structure that they have is all based off of POSIX. Other applications, education, we have books, we have Kindle Reader, Open Library, Project Gutenberg, we've got presentation software, research and writing, uh, different resources, Brand Yourself, Coursera, um, Khan Academy, a lot of people have been using a lot of those resources because of different ways to teach, different ways to pull in the latest and greatest. We have been in a, um, a stagnant, little, I, I hate to say it, a lot of people have been using real stagnant material. Don't just go ahead and try to import all of your course. Pull that information down and create a new course in Canvas and then pull the information you need. That way it's a lot easier to see, uh, do I have the latest stuff? Is this information pertinent today? Maybe I have to go a little bit away from my book. I do go away from my book a lot of the time. With, um, with the Canvas LTIs, we can pull in Khan Academy. We can pull in all of these features that we would wish to have in our, uh, in our teaching strategies. We have Google Calendar in our self-management student stuff. We have BookBite, Book Renter, Cheap Air, Kindle eBook Buyer, No, Rent Text, and Tux Games. So a lot of these we have Study Study Aids, AnyWeb, Dictionary, Open Dictionary, Scribbler, Treeler, and Wise Mapping. And then different subjects we have Math and Science. They only have one application, Google Sky. But you can see, if we went out and we started to purchase all these applications, we told our student, hey, you need this. You also need this. In another class, they say, okay, well, we need you to also purchase, okay. Let's see here. 
<laughs> yeah, no doubt. Let's see if I've just got the eye candy going. Let's see. Desktop effects. Let's go to stop all desktop effects. All right. Um, it's wanting to be on a physical machine. Where a, a virtual machine allows that crazy little layout where we don't have to have all these machines where we go out and install stuff. All right, so one of the websites that I use with my students on a day-to-day -day basis. <coughs> is DistroWatch. With DistroWatch, they can go out, they can see the latest versions of Linux. And like I said, they're all about preference. So, what Linux version do you want to install? There are thousands. They're all about your preference. What do you need out of your operating system? My students, when we first install, when they're taking intro to Linux, they don't have the option to get some GUI or a graphical based interface. They don't have that privilege. So they install an operating system and when they get to their login screen that's all they see. They see the command prompt. With every resource that we need is available in, in the command prompt. Microsoft has um, changed gears. They've changed gears when they developed Microsoft Server 2008. They said, okay, we see what Linux has been doing for the last millennia, <laughs> as it seems. So they get there and they're like, okay, how can we make a stronger, more robust operating system? How can we take it where a full-on developer can manipulate this operating system? They don't need that graphical user interface. So what Microsoft has uh, created is a operating system inside of server we had the opportunity to install called server core. And server core is just this, a command line. There are no bells and whistles. They, keyboard is the only way to interact with the machine. Your mouse doesn't work. So a lot of students, I've had them where they're doing the install. That's what they have to do first. Again, they're learning the operating system from the ground up. I think they get a better understanding when they get it from the ground up. This is a uh, utility called Top. It's just showing the top process that is running. We can see the actual owner of who's running this process being root. And I do not like that it's so dark. All right, so let me go to a different Linux-based OS. All right, so with VirtualBox, and VMware, VirtualBox is from Oracle. It originally came from uh, Sun and Java, and once Oracle, bought, <coughs> once Oracle bought Sun, they started branding everything that Sun had. So we have Microsoft 7 that I've got installed. I can install and run Windows XP. OpenSUSE is another version of Linux that I can run. Then I also have Mac OS X, another version of SUSE where it's again a different interface. Where this one is running off of what the um, developing engine is called KDE, the K desktop environment. Then we also have OpenSUSE where GNOME. GNOME is just another version. Again, what preferences do you have? How do you want your operating system to interact with you? It's the same thing when it comes to your phone. Wait, I have an Android, but my, my, uh, my computer's Windows based. Am I gonna be able to make them communicate? Yes, there's tons of software that allows you to transfer all of your data back and forth. So many people think, well, I bought an iPhone, I've gotta get a Mac. That's it, I mean, I've got to get a Mac. Or I bought an Android, so I need to get a Google Chrome notebook. I need to find some type of notebook where I can install Linux. And then those of you who get the Windows phone, well, I definitely already have a Windows operating system. Again, it's your choice. All of these can inter, uh, interconnect and talk to one another. You don't have to go with one camp. I have got Androids, 
I have Macs, I have Windows, I have Unix. Uh, those of you who uh, have been around computers for a long time, I have a box still running DOS. I, it really doesn't matter to me. Computers are computers are computers. They're all tools. How we play with the tool is really up to us. How we get this information back to us, whether it's an email, whether it's a text message, we can get resources that allow us to benefit from all this great technology. Then we have another version, Feduntu. Uh, the names just get crazier and crazier. Uh, Windows Server 2008. Some of y'all's uh, IT may be running 2003, 2008, or they may have even switched up to Server 8, the latest version of Server. But with this, we have the opportunity to communicate with any type of device. Whatever operating system we have, we can communicate it. With Server, I can install the ability to push out files to a Windows machine, to a Mac, or to Linux. It really depends on what type of operating systems we have in our labs. Um, I am I'm blessed because with computer networking, I get to manipulate my own lab. All the people kind of despise me because I can do updates. That's no fair. I want my own server. Okay, do you know how to run a server? No, but will you show me? Yeah, I'll show you. I don't care. I love this stuff. This is my life. Uh, my little boy. He's nine years old. And whenever he started on computers, that's all he got. He had a command line. He's nine years old, and he can do a lot more with less than most nine-year-olds, most of my students. They don't see what the benefit is there. Well, my, my boy, his name is Rain, he said, that's what I want to do. I want to play with computers. I said, well, yeah, I guess you could call me playing. That's all I do. I play on computers. Anytime he wants to run a game, he has to know the command. He has to type it out. He's got to think, what do I want this machine to do for me? Not just clicking a button or hitting an icon. He's got to think about the operating system. He's got to understand the way that the operating system is working. So that's, again, me creating a nerd. Um, but that's what I do. I enjoy it. My wife... She's a fourth, fifth, and sixth English reading and spelling instructor. Hates computers. I do not care about computers. I do not want to use a computer. If it breaks, I don't have to worry about it. You can fix it for me. So again, it's really about your choice. She's, a, she's kind of uh, timid when it comes to an operating system. She's been using it a lot more after I showed her her Elmo. I said, look, you can do a lot with a smart board. So I've been making her do quizzes. So she can take a quiz that she created on her computer, put it on the smart board, and then her and her students can actually do a quiz as a class or they can do it separately. But all these resources that I like to use are all free. I don't understand why so many people go out and just, I've got to buy, I've got to buy, I've got to buy. All right, so going back to the slideshow really doesn't matter what type of hardware you have. You have all this plethora of tools. We have some of the biggest amount of waste in the U.S. We get a new phone and it either sits there, we throw it in the closet, or we give it away, or throw it away. Um, watch out with EPA. Don't just throw your components away. I love to get older machines especially when it comes to some of the county schools that don't have the resources, don't have the budget to buy new machines. So me and my students, we have, we've adopted a couple schools where we'll go in and we'll take machines that have come out of people's closets, install Linux on it, and then we can bring that to that student. The students can have a computer. The students can use a computer. Also, we do raffles. We can take free software, install it, and just give it away. We don't have to worry about buying some type of software. So depending on the arch of technology you have, it really is beneficial to understand that device, to be able to use the most of that device. All right, so looking at some of the resources, 
We have different types of resources out here. So instead of you having to buy all these applications, we can go, we can use Evernote. Evernote works across the board, whether you have an Android, whether you have an iPhone or a Windows phone. We can use Evernote, and what Evernote does It allows us to go, oh, wrong way. We can capture anything, we can access it anywhere, we can find things fast. Evernote also has a lot of other features and tools that we can get, whether it's Web Clipper, uh, Sketch, uh, Pen Ultimate, Evernote Hello, and a lot of these are just free completely free tools that we can use on our um, handhelds. This can be a laptop. We can get Evernote for a laptop. We can also get it for our tablets and all of our phones. So it really doesn't matter what operating system we're running. We can get to the resources we need. We don't have to just go out and pay. We also have Dropbox. A lot of people will use Dropbox because it's really easy to go back and forth and drop information to ourselves. We don't have to carry it with us everywhere. Anywhere you have internet access, you can get Dropbox. We can take files that we're using, put them in our Dropbox repository, and then any time that we're going back and forth, let's say we forgot our laptop at the house, or it's happened before, your nine-year-old spills water on your laptop and you're having to rebuild it and let it dry out replace motherboard or replace memory but I can always access my stuff remotely I doesn't matter I can get to this site I can get to Dropbox I can get to my content I am a big um, supporter of Google Drive I have been using Google Docs in the classroom for golly probably four and a half five years I did not uh, I, I don't I'm I'm ashamed to say this because my mother works at the research curriculum unit and is a big advocate of Blackboard. Loves it. She is the Blackboard guru. Uh, Y'all may, may have even had to work with her, Marilyn Bowen. She does a lot with Blackboard. She just really, really enjoys it. I hated it. Every time I would try to use Blackboard, some bug would come up. Or, Blackboard's down. Don't we all love that email? But again, when you have one database that houses 15 community colleges, what happens if one entry is bad? We all go down. That's what I love about the Canvas approach. We're not having to worry about going down. It's going to be on the Amazon cloud. It's a cloud-based resource. Everybody, what is the cloud? Well, Dropbox. We're storing data in the cloud. It is out on the web for us to access. Whether it's a uh, software application, uh, whether it's files that we need, we're going to have it out there. Uh, they were talking about the scalability. That's what I really love about Canvas. Because what happens the first, middle, and the end of the semester when you try to get on Blackboard? Click and wait. Click and wait. All right, so they have an automatic way to actually increase the server load. So you don't have to worry about that slag, that slowdown, and that drag. But with Google Drive, again, another free resource that we can install on our um, desktop, laptop, tablet, doesn't matter. I have mine, I've got a couple of different, um, let me maximize that a little bit. I've created folders in mine. <laughs> As you can see, I'm, I already had to do a training on Canvas last Friday for the RCU. They're looking at, before we even had Canvas training, I had to go and train. I'm a big nerd. I installed Canvas before I knew that you could go to a website and just create an account. I pulled all the resources down, open source, and then I built, have y'all looked at uh, collaboration and um, uh, conferencing in Canvas yet? All right, so they use Big Blue Button. Big Blue Blood, <laughs> tongue tie. B3 or BBB allows you to do that teleconferencing. We can use that as a free resource. I've been using BBB for three years by itself. 
the, the cool thing about me being a nerd, I installed a beta version of Big Blue Button. With the beta version, it gave us the opportunity to capture our lessons. So we could save all of those discussions. I mean, we could save all of those conferences. So I showed the, um, I showed the school what Canvas looked like, what Big Blue Button would do for us. And they said, oh, this is cool that you can go ahead and you can do this conference and then you can capture it for a later date. And then I got into the live version that's out online, uh, canvas.instructure.com. There was no record feature. There was no save feature. So again, I had to talk to the developers. I said, all right, am I just such a big nerd that I put the beta version on and y'all are not supporting it yet? Yes, <laughs> you are such a nerd. We do not have the beta version in. But they said by July 1, not July 1, by what, June 1st, May, June, losing my mind, they will have it up because Big Blue Button is going to be stable. All right, with the developmental stuff, they are, they're buggy. They're still trying to fix all the issues with it. Once we get that stability, we will have the opportunity to record and save our conferences, which is going to be great, especially for students who couldn't make it to that session. They can still log back in. Uh, different ways that we can use Google Drive. All right, so if we want to create something, what do we want to create? In networking, I have them, by the time they get to advanced server and advanced Linux, they have to build a full network for me. Now with floor planner, they have to think about, okay, I've got to create this one layout. I'll give them three buildings. They have to go out and create three buildings. They have to link and show me where the servers are, where the PCs are, do they have laptops, do they have wireless devices. They build the whole shoot and match. I give them a budget. They say, oh, you going to buy these for us? I wish I could. I wish I could buy you all of this hardware and all these resources. But it gets them in a, in a mindset that, hey, I've got to know the ground up. I've got to know how to run these wires. I've got to know that, hey, I don't need to run wire across some type of power light because it could degrade my signal. A lot of people still don't do that. They still will run wires right over electrical boxes and fluorescence. And you wonder why your lab is slow. But we can create documents, which are equivalent to a Word document or RTF, a rich text document, presentations, spreadsheets, forms, drawings. I have been using these a lot because with, with the quizzes, I've been taking, let's say I go into advanced Linux, We've got advanced Linux quiz. I created a form, and in this form, if I go to the live form, this is what a student would see. All right, uh, what command will show the system layout and type of partition as well as be human readable? So they have to know the commands. It puts it back in my Google Drive, and I know who has or has not actually taken their quiz. Uh, again, I make sure they put their name in it if they want to receive credit. There's just different ways that we can use technology. We don't have to go out and buy something. So many people think that, oh, it's, it's crap if I don't have to pay for it. Why? 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 Why would you be in that mindset? Oh, that's right. Most people are in a Microsoft-based mindset. <laughs> We've got to buy stuff. Got to keep buying. Uh, different quizzes, they have really been beneficial for our students. Um, this, being in Google Drive, when we, whenever you create a collaboration, if you have Google Docs set up, the collaboration allows you to use Google Docs. So what it did in my drive, I just did a Canvas test. And it allows them to manipulate this Google document that I have out. So they can go out and they can collaborate with one another. But you can organize your um, Google Drive any way you would like. That's what I enjoy. I can get to my resources very easy. I don't have to worry about going to this computer because I have it saved locally or this computer. I can do it from my phone. I can do it from a tablet. I can do it 
from a laptop, a desktop, a server. Does not matter. All right, so going back, we've got some more resources. Uh, also have Bitly. This is a good one um, if you're using, if you went to the uh, Canvas trainings. I could have given y'all this real long link. This real long Google Doc link. But, with, and I'm going to, I've got it on the last slide so you can download this. But instead of giving y'all this real long link, what Bitly does, it allows us to create a shorter link so someone doesn't have to type out this long string of text. That's real beneficial, especially when you have these resources out online. You can tell your students, in the class, write this down. <laughs> Trying to get some of these long strings down, they'll transpose numbers. Uh, might put a hyphen instead of a slash. So you get a lot of issues. But what this did, it just shortened it to uh, bit.ly forward slash capital WP2AYH. So again, just easier for my students to use the computer and use all of the links and resources that I like. All right, so a lot of people are familiar with Microsoft Office. They know Microsoft Office. That's their comfort zone. I don't want to use pages on an Apple phone. I don't want to use um, LibreOffice, even though it's completely free. You can use CloudOn. CloudOn used to be only available for iOS-based devices. Now with CloudOn, we can get it on your Android. And with CloudOn, it just pulls Word, PowerPoint, and Excel into your tablet, where you can manipulate Word files, you can manipulate PowerPoint and Excel. You don't have to have an external app. It's all built into CloudOn, and it's really good for uh, collaboration and sending all your information out. Uh, then we also, I, I put slash dot up here just because I like to know the latest news for nerds. Alright, so with slash dot, you can see this is a uh, really good site that has different types of hardware, different types of resources. Um, Facebook introduces a mobile oriented redesign. So it tells us the latest security threats, the latest issues when it comes to computers. Then we can go and we can look at cloud-based resources, hardware, Linux, management, mobile, science, security, storage. You've got all these resources at the drop of a hat where so many students say, well, I go to this website for this and this and this, and they have 50 websites that they check every morning before they come to class. I always try to show them slash dot so they can go out and they can get a lot of good information really quick and from one, one specific place. They don't have to go everywhere. All right, then we also uh, put DistroWatch, which I already showed you, DistroWatch, uh, Microsoft, as well as Apple. Um, two big company, oh, sorry, wrong way. Two big companies that both provide, you know, really good operating systems. I'm not opposed to using technology for my benefit. One thing that I love about a Windows-based machine, gaming. <laughs> you, if you're a gamer, they're the, some of the best games are on Microsoft-based Windows. Up until about the last two months. Now, what Linux has released has been a version of Steam. And what Steam does, it allows us to take games that we've purchased and install them on Linux. Now, a lot of these games, I like Linux because I have that freedom. I can do with that operating system what I like. And what Steam allows you to do is pull in those games. So before too long, I won't even have to power up a Windows 7, Windows 8 gaming machine. I can just leave my Linux box running. Um, also with Mac, with an Apple-based operating system, a lot of graphic design people really love an Apple because they have certain tools that they enjoy. I, I like Apple for its ease of use. One, one utility that I love is remote mouse. Remote mouse works great. You can use it on a tablet or a phone. And what remote mouse allows you to do is uh, pretty much control your computer with your phone. 
I go anywhere I want to. It's just like heaven. But you, the only bad thing about it, hopefully they don't have a firewall blocking certain ports. Every once in a while I'll get to a location and I can't use my mouse. Thank goodness that this, it connects to the same Wi-Fi. So as long as I've got Wi-Fi on my machine and I'm connected to creating futures, so is my phone. So I can go and I can use this just as a mouse, any way I want to. Don't have to go back and forth. Really depends on what I want to actually go out and do. Oh, did not mean to, I will close that. And any resource that I can help with, I, I love any type of operating system. I'm not uh, an elitist. A lot of our um, ITs, they're elitist. Uh, Windows only way to go. Apple's the only way to go. Linux is the only I don't care. An operating system is an operating system. If it gets my job done, I could care less. I just want to be able to get my job done and have the resources I need right on hand. going back to the screen and I, I started this last night at about what was it Craig about nine <laughs> so I, it may not be the full 75 minutes but I wanted y'all to have this link where you can download the presentation at bitly bit dot ly then we have forward slash capital WP two a Y H and as well as my work phone and my email address if you ever have any type of issue I'm I'm here for you I go and I do professional development I'll do anything that I can to help faculty students team members it doesn't matter to me I enjoy my job I enjoy what I do it, it doesn't feel like a job to me I come to work and it's playtime ready to go just have a good time. Uh, some people, some people, they don't. They begrudgingly get up and go to work. I don't understand that. I don't understand how you can't enjoy everything. So here's my email address. If you ever need anything, please feel free. Um, do you have any questions? How do you clean up a Mac? How do you clean up a Mac? Yeah. All right, so you have different, what are, what are we trying to clean up? Just Temporary up. files? Yeah, like you did Mm -hmm. so what, what's the equivalent of that? Okay. All right, so I'll go into system preferences. And when I'm in system preferences, I'm going to go into user and groups. And depending on your user and group, we'll go into login options. And login options, and let me go ahead and authenticate. we can see what tools what we're actually uh, loading and then in my profile now that it's unlocked I can go into login items and with login items I can actually remove any item that is starting up by default and I don't have to have it running and as soon as I want it to run I simply click an icon any other questions comments concerns well, I hope everybody has a great uh, trip back home today, and thank you all so very much. Thank you.